Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome dear learners to the another session of International Business Management. I am Dr. Manisha Goswami, Assistant Professor at Institute of Business Management, GLA University, Matra. Today we are going to begin with lecture number 4 and lecture number 4 is going to be regarding the international business environment. Before we proceed with the lecture number 4, let us look at the topics that we had discussed in the previous lecture. In the previous lecture, we talked about the globalization particularly the dark side and the penalty different countries, especially developing and underdeveloped countries are paying because of globalization has been discussed in much more detail. Second, we talked about the geography of the world, why it was essential to understand the geography of the world before taking a step into international market. We discussed about on the basis of the world, world map, on the basis of the Asia map, on the basis of the European country map, North American map, South American map, and we try to figure out the different regional integration these different continents are forming among the different countries in order to promote and peaceful trading among each other, which eventually helping the countries which were not doing earlier good now started doing good after the regional integration. So it can be a lesson for us to understand and start imbibing those things by learning from the success of others. Now we are going to begin with the lecture number 4 and the lecture number 4 there are certain objectives before starting with this lecture number 4 let us look at them. So by the end of this lecture you will be able to understand and visualize and critically analyze as well the political, legal and economical environment. Ecological, technological, sociocultural environment will be discussed in the next lecture but we are confining our discussion today's till the economical environment. So let us begin with the international business environment and what actually it is and how it is affecting the international business. Let us start with that. So international business environment is a multi-dimensional in nature. It not only talk about the environment, ecology or atmosphere, it is particularly talking about the political environment, it is talking about the cultural differences, taste and preference differences, customs, rituals which are different that is covering under the socio-cultural environment. It is also talking about the technological advancements. It is talking about the legal and taxation issues. It is also talking about the exchange risk. So international business environment as a whole will be helping a particular company or entrepreneur who is going to take the decision of entering into interna international market should have a fair by understanding the international business environment will be having a fair understanding that which particular country holds which kind of political environment and on the basis of their regularities on the basis of the legal environment I also need to adjust my strategies. So anyone who is thinking of entering into international business or who is thinking of having any sort of collaboration with foreign countries should have the fair understanding of international business environment before taking a call for it. Therefore, we can say that international business environment is an essential thing for a country's economy because it is somehow helping you to take correct decisions. If you are missing out with this idea of studying the international business environment, there may be the possibility you may take the wrong decision and that wrong decision is not only going to affect you badly but also the economy of the nation to which you belong is also going to get affected. Thus, we can say international business environment is essential for country's economy. It plays a significant role in the growth and development of different nations. Environment analysis 
is important. It's utmost important before you are taking a course of action. You need to monitor all the factors of the environment from the perspective of international business, from the perspective of international horizon or the international commerce. You have to understand and visualize that how this new market is going to be from the perspective of political environment, from the perspective of legal environment, economical environment, socio-cultural environment, technological, ecological environment. You need to have that understanding before you are taking the call of entering into international market. It also helps you to figure out the various opportunities and threats prevailing in the international market. And if you are prepared well in advance about the various list of the opportunities there in the foreign market which you can engage, you can figure out that how I am going to make use of my strength to maximize this particular opportunity. And if you come across certain threats, then you should be able to find out that how I am going to make use of my strength to minimize the threats. So such analysis is only possible when you have monitored the environment, international environment before taking a action of entering into international market. Now let's begin with the first factor of the environment that is a political environment. Political environment is governed by the government of that country where you are taking a decision of entering. Say for example, any country who want to enter into India, they have to understand the political environment created by the current government of India. If they try to visualize or if they try to have a presumption or any sort of assumption that this is the political environment by and large I have seen in America, I have seen in European countries, I have seen in the Russian country as well. So uh, I, I develop certain presumptions, I develop certain an idea about the political environment for the whole world which is not going to be the right way of dealing with the political environment. Every country is having their own setup of the political environment and you have to give respect to it. You cannot presume anything on the basis of your past experience with maybe number of countries in the past or you might be quite successful based on your presumption about those different countries might be possible but may not be possible in every course of action or may not be possible in countries like India where the lot of diversity is already there. So you cannot presume anything. You have to factually analyze the environment of the country where you want to head, where you want to establish your business. So political environment of business can be understood as the political or government action that affect the business activities. So if government is in favor, will support the business. Government is not in favor, you don't have the courage or you don't have the audacity to question the government back. You have to bear the consequences of that. Political factors run simultaneously with the legal factors or the legal, envi legal environmental issues and are generally viewed as a non-market force that impact business. Change in government often calls for the change in the policies and that is related to your business. If government is changing any industrial policy, if the government is bringing certain change in the IT sector, all the IT companies are going to get affected by those slight changes which government has made in the IT sector. If government has introduced some strict cyber crime security laws, and entire e-commerce of India is going to get affected by it. So that means if a government is coming up with certain legal changes, as I just stated in a previous paragraph, that political environment and legal environment go hand, hand in hand. So if government is bringing certain changes in the legal system, in the policy system, then it is going to directly affect a particular sector for which there is a change and then directly affect the various other business who are interrelated. Thus, we can say that action taken by government which might affect the daily business activities, these actions might be national, international or totally depending upon the local domestication. Now, let's look at the political system. Political system can be classified based on the party system in the society and mode in which government is coming or attaining the power. 
based on the way the government come into power they can be classified into parliamentary type or absolutist type the citizen elect parliamentary government and absolutist governments are not elected they come into power by force based on the number of party active in country the political system establishment can be classified into the three different types like single party two party multi party and there can be some sort of a uh, uh, democracy in the country which can be considered as a fourth type now let's look at the different types of the political system that is multi party democracy it means there are multiple parties in the country and on the basis and there will be the election and on the basis of the majority will be going to win and they are going to get the that they, they are going to get the power to rule the country it is not like that any anybody himself or herself raise themselves as a supreme powerful person and i am now i am going to rule the country this is not the case in the multi democracy here everyone is having a full right to fight the election and it's on the basis of the majority of voting you will be elected or you may not be elected to run the country as a government next is your uh, any that the, there are number of countries like india is one of the country who is having multi party democracy philippines poland sweden tunisia ukraine ireland these are the different countries following the multi party democracy however the one party state is just a contrary to the multi party democracy here in one party state is a type of sovereign state in which only one political party has a right to form the government based on on their existing constitution for example china north korea cuba they are having one party state style of having a political system or ruling the ruling the government ruling the uh, country another one is the constitutional monarchy who are the monarchs monarch is a political system in which supreme authority is vested on monarch monarch is a person going to be like a king of the entire nation and it is quite similar to the dictatorship as we can see in the military and the non military cases you will you will find some dictatorship and it is quite similar to the dictatorship because one person has absolute power like japan denmark cambodia belgium are having such kind of kingdom ship earlier where they are getting a supreme power from all and they are ruling the entire nation as a king and we have seen dictatorship in germany under hitler and soviet union under stalin in the political environment there are certain political risk as also and what these political risk is all about these political risk may be creating a hindrance of taking a decision of entering into the international business or taking a decision of entering into your country these political system will also give you a fair idea about taking a decision of entering into a particular country if i found the particular country is following a dictatorship i won't be taking a decision of entering into a country where dictatorship is prevailing why because the dictator is going to intervene into my business activity so this is not the right system for me to enter into the right system for the foreign investment would be multi party democracy if a country is having multi party democracy it is going to give me a leverage a benefit to enter into a country because i would also be having certain say or i will be having a hope that if there will be a change in the political system there will be the change in the philosophy so i may take a decision of entering into countries like where the multi party democracy is there or a one party state is become is a, it's a comparatively difficult to enter into because whatever the particular person who is holding a government ship is stating is going to be considered as a final one so you don't have much autonomy to take your own decision here all the decisions are going to be taken by the government who is in the power so this political system is helping you to decide which political system would be more favorable for you to enter into the host country now similarly on the basis of the political system there are some more factors which can affect a decision of entering into a international market that can be political risk political risk under the political risk the first point is 
expropriation or confiscation. Confiscation is like a, the seizing where the government try to seize certain properties and though these two terms are used interchangeably or you can say these are the synonym of each other but there is a slight difference between confiscation and expropriation. In confiscation what used to happen the government is not going to pay the compensation to the seized property of yours. But whereas in case of expropriation, government is going to pay compensation. So if such kind of system is prevailing in a country and you might be taking a decision of buying a land, you are going to have a plant over there in the foreign country, you are looking for having your wholly owned subsidiary over there, then this might be a point of concern. If your land is coming in some of the area where certain infrastructure development of the country has to take place, then government may seize your land. And if it is expropriation, you may get the compensation. But that compensation will not suffice the purpose because you, you are already running a business over there. And, and then all of a sudden, the government sees your property and then you have to restart and rethinking from where that where to buy another new land, how to restart the entire structure and system again. So this is not the good thing which usually create a risk in the mind of foreign investor before taking off investment in any country. Next is the currency in convertibility. That means the government of the nation don't allow the foreign investor to take the money from in, to take the money from their country. Nigeria did it in the early years for a complete two decades in order to maintain the economical and political stability of the country. Here, the government don't allow any currency conversion. They don't allow the foreign investors to take their currency out for political and economical reasons. And in order to protect the economy of a country, Nigeria did it for continuously two decades. Next political risk is the credit risk. Country don't pay the debt. That means they don't honor the financial contracts. And if a country dishonor the financial contract, what is going to happen? That means whatever the money you as a IMF or World Bank has invested in a particular country and they are denying to repay it back to you. So it's going to be a significant loss. Country like Mexico did in the year 1980s when they were badly suffering from economic recession. They don't have any other choice. They have to take this call and they declared that they won't be able to honor the financial contract. So that is also a risky thing. If a particular country is doing in such manner and you are thinking of investing your money in Mexico during those years. Now the situation of Mexico is good because uh, just after a few years, they formed the regional integration between Canada, USA and, um, and it was a between Canada, USA. They formed the North American Free Trade Association, become Mexico become a part of it. And after form, becoming a part of regional this regional integration, the economy of the Mexico start improving. I'm talking of the era of 1980s when they were struggling very badly with economic recession. At that time, Mexico dishonored the financial contract. So if anybody would be thinking of entering into any country, where there are a lot of terrorism, maybe um, there may a lot of economic fluctuations and ups and downs are taking like Venezuela in current state, Greece currently having an uh, economic crisis. So these countries, if you want to invest there, there is always a question in your mind that will my money get stuck up or not. So you, you usually don't feel comfortable to invest your money in certain countries. Next, risk from ethnic, religious or civil strife. That means uh, if you are investing in a country where the religious or religion values are very high, like in case of Meghdi, it happened. They invested in India, they come up with the franchisee system, then the people buy the franchisee here in India. The person who purchased the McDonald's franchisee was Indian and despite of that, he come up with the beef burger. That was a significant back of the Magdi and they even have to apologize for the kind of the burger they offer to Indian market. 
Amazon even stated the apology because they come up with uh, because they come up with certain products having the uh, impression of our DTs on it, which is not acceptable by the Indian customer, and they have to apologize. So, risk of ethnic and religious and civil strife is another very important before entering into any such country where the ethnical grounds or cultural rituals are very strong, you cannot penetrate into it rather than before without accepting with them as a right ritual, you cannot enter. First, you have to give respect to the culture of the host country and there you can easily enter into. Next political risk is going to be the corruption. Country Somalia is one of the world corrupt country. India is ranking 86th in the, uh, as per the corruption index given in 2020. And the least corrupt countries are like Denmark, Netherlands, Singapore. These are the least corrupt countries. So if you are planning to enter into certain countries where the corruption level is high, there is a possibility of what? There will be the possibility of uh, being cheated. There is a possibility of bureaucracy, red tapism, favoritism, right? So how you will be able to sustain? So you need to strike the balance that there are certain countries, though they are corrupt, but they are very rich in resources. So what I should do before taking a call of entering into certain countries? I need to find out the probable solutions. Right? So, if a particular country is very rich in resources but it is equally corrupt, then I need to find some legal formalities, I need to find certain legal agreements before entering into countries so that I can assure that I can get back the money which I have invested in the country if I am undergoing with certain legal system. So, political risk is another reason why anybody would be worrying, a, worrying before entering into any international market. Now let's begin with the legal environment. Legal environment is, is about formation of the law system. As I just told you that when there is a corruption, follow some legal agreements. So if you are following some legal agreements, you are somehow protecting yourself from being cheated. Uh, if anybody cheats you, then there are certain law system which will help you to take out your money from. So global legal environment refer to the legal environment in the international business. The legal environment regulate the operation of the firm in the international market. It is sufficient of a, it is sufficient for a firm operating at the domestic level to stick to regulation of the land. But organization operating in different country need to know and compile with the law of domestic country as well as all the host country they operate in. Government imposed law to protect the home industry from cutthroat global competition, right? So they have to have certain legal environment, they need to have certain regulatory framework which can protect the domestic companies from being uh, from the MNCs or any foreign investment coming from the foreign countries to your country. They impose different kind of tariff, enter into agreement and sign treaties to protect indigenous industries and promote local trade. When government feel that the home industry is affected by or uh, because of the end dumping, they are going to impose heavy anti-dumping regulations. To protect domestic industry, they can also impose non-tariff barriers and frame regulations for the uh, foreign investment. There are certain custom duties which we should know well in advance before understanding the complete legal environment and as so far you might have understood that legal environment is actually creating a strong wall around the various domestic com companies and helping the domestic company or infant industries to flourish and do the business within this aura of strong custom duties because they are not allowing for investors to invest in your country and if foreign investor will not invest domestic companies are going to be safe because they will be having no competition or might they might be having less competition if any mnc will come they will come with advanced technology they will come with advanced product or the features which easily swayed the attention of the customer towards them so, if any country government want to protect particular sector, particular domestic company, they usually impose restriction for foreigners to invest in a particular sector. 
Now let's understand the different types of custom duties. The first one is the basic custom duty. This basic custom duty is a duty imposed on the value of goods at a specific rate. Second, it is like a import tax imposed on certain goods in order to prevent dumping or counter export subsidies. Third is the safeguard duty. These safeguard duties are like quotas can be imposed if unexpectedly there is an increase in import which is posing a threat. If there is any unexpected increase in import of certain commodity which is increasing a threat of being deficit country then there is going to be a safeguard duty. It can be imposed quickly but the validity of the safeguard duty is going to be very short as compared to this uh, countervailing duty or the basic anti-dumping duty. Anti-dumping duty is usually imposed in a country where they are founding there is a threat of the kind of product the foreign companies are coming up with in India. Like China used to uh, dump a lot of obsolete product in India market. So Indian government has imposed anti-dumping duty on certain products which is coming from China. Next is the education says on custom duty. Education says on custom duty has been lived on item imported into India. It is chargeable at 2% on the aggregate of duty of custom. And finally, the next different type of uh, the custom duty is ad volram duty. Ad volram duty is a Latin verb. Volram is a ad volram is a Latin word which means on value. And it is lived as fixed percentage of value of the commodity imported. USA currently impose 2.5% of end volume duty on imported automobile. So these custom duties are also going to give you a fair idea which country has imposed heavy duty on certain commodity or the product. If I am looking for buying or taking some raw material uh, related to automobile being in USA, then I have to bear the ad volume duty, right? So I need to find out the better solution instead of bearing unnecessary duties. Next are the non-tariff barriers. Non-tariff barriers are what? These barriers are are basically for protecting the environment of the nation. So the primary objective of non-tariff measures or technical barriers to trade is to protect the environment from the polluted products. Measures include restriction on trade with hazardous substances or pollutant harming aquatic or terrestrial ecosystem. So for this, there are certain laws related to sanitary and phytosanitary measures. Sanitary is related to human and animal cell. Phytosanitary is related to the plants. So if any product is coming related to the human animal or any of uh, the product related to the plants and uh, it may be the pesticide you are using or maybe you are using certain drugs or the medication which may harm the human or the animal then there are certain law which is going to be coming under the non-tariff barriers because none of the government want to uh, take the risk of harming the human animal and plant life. So they ensure the proper protection and ensure the, uh, the health, healthy environment for the plant, healthy environment for the human body, healthy environment even for animals. There are some more non-tariff barriers like foreign investment regulations do come under the non-tariff barriers and every country is having their own foreign investment regulation like US is having their own, India is having their own, China, Japan, Korea, you just name the country, every country is having their own foreign investment regulation. So you have to read those foreign investment regulations well in advance before taking the action. 
litigation, dispute settlement, cyber law is there and because of advancement in the technology, the e-commerce is increasing like anything, everything is happening through uh, network, uh, through telecommunication or information technology and the transportation technology is also improving with GPRS and other system. So there is a need of a cyber crime and there is a need for controlling the cyber crime or the hacking. So there are certain cyber laws in USA, cyber laws of India, you just name the country, every country would be having their cyber law system, digital and electronic signature to be protected. So there are certain laws under the cyber crime. Even, uh, even in quotum is there, in quotum is what international commerce commercial terms right these inco terms are the series of predefined commercial terms published by international chamber of commerce relating to international commercial law right so every government is having some or the other international commercial laws before entering into country government you need to have a fair understanding or rather hire the legal advisor from that country Hiring a legal advisor of that country and the legal advisor from your country will be having a discussion with each other and somehow you will be able to find the amicable solution to deal with multiple countries across the globe. Now, we what as a whole in nutshell, what we can conclude for the legal environment particularly and political environment as a whole. So we can say it consists of array of acts, rules and regulation. It also have certain measures for protecting the intellectual properties, right? Because of globalization, piracy is increasing and that's a crime, hacking is happening. So for protecting the intellectual property, there has to have certain law for it. And India also have their Indian Patent Act and internationally is also taken care by WIPO. So there are measures, legal environment is protecting the intellectual property by copyright, by giving copyright to them or by giving patent to them or by giving trademark to the logo, symbols and other punchlines. This, the law which are passed by the government for business operation is called the legal environment. In every country, the government regulate business activities. These regulation of a government are considered as legal environment. So the political and legal environment go hand in hand. So when you are looking, because every government who is currently ruling a particular country is having their own philosophy, is having their own ideology and on the basis of their philosophy, ideology, how they are looking up to their country, how much they want the progression or growth of the country, on the basis they are going to set the different policies of the nation. Policies related to different industry, IT sector, how much growth they are aspiring from the IT sector, on the basis they are going to set the policy, the growth line, the vision for the IT sector or how much they are expecting from the agriculture sector, what uh, corrective actions to be taken care of, what should be exported, what should not be exported, right. So on the basis of that, they will be framing the policies. So the legal and political environment as it is largely governed by the government philosophy and ideology. So for this, it is, it is becoming very important that if you are liking a particular government policy or the ideology or the philosophy, then you will also look for political stable environment. So the particular country where the political environment is stable also ensure some sense of security in the mind of investor that such policies will last for at least the entire tenure of this current government and will give you a sense of relief to frame and strategize your course of action. Now let's move to the next environment factor that is economic environment which is another very important environment because now nobody is doing business for the charity everyone is into the market for the profit for the profit maximization and for the wealth maximization so if these two things are so essential we need to understand the economic environment of the country as well it should not be like that if I invested a money in a particular country and my money got stuck up. I don't want to invest in any country where the economic environment is very fluctuating. 
the way the people look for po stable political environment similarly people also look for constantly progressing economic environment rather than a stagnant or fluctuating environment now let's look at the economic environment economies of a country can be classified based on parameters such as ownership of means of production and levels of economic development how much resources a particular country hold and what is the level of their growth are they are constant for so many years so the way we expect stable political environment but we don't expect the stable economic environment we want there should be some progression in or there should be some growth of the economy of a country but there should be no fluctuations based on the ownership of the means of production economies can be classified into capitalistic economy socialistic economy or a mixed economy capitalistic economy is a pure economy where the private players are having full autonomy private players are taking the decision they are ruling the government intervention is negligible where in case of socialistic economy here there is no role of the private players private companies are not in shape everything is ruled and governed by government government is having full autonomy government is intervening into each and every business activity that is a socialistic economy so these are the two extremes one side of the continuum is the capitalistic economy where only private players are there other side of the continuum is the socialistic economy where the government is there no private player is there but a country like us india follow the mixed economy where we took the merits of capitalistic economy as well as the merits of the socialistic economy so the country like us is having a blend of both capitalistic economy and a socialistic economy so we are having private companies and as well as the government companies private players always run their business for profit this may not be true in case of the government units or the public units may or may not be doing the business for the profit they might be doing for business for the charity for giving jobs may might be doing business for improving the economy of the nation not purely just for earning the profits so based on their level of development countries can be classified into a developing country or a developed country the world bank rely on income level to classify countries into these categories now economic environment can affect business adversely or it can affect international business very favorably so economic environment as having a significant impact on the international business we should understand that foreign trade largely depend upon what healthy economic development so instead of making use of the economy of a country or the national income of the country rather we should facilitate and grow the economy of the nation where we have invested the money we should contribute to the nation's economy if economy of the nation will grow and flourish undoubtedly your business will also grow and flourish there is a wide variation between one host country to another in terms of economic system right like uh, like we people are following the mixed economy the other might be following the capitalistic economy the country uh, the people coming from china or other places they might be following the socialistic economy right so every different country is having their own economic system so as you are having different economic system so what we need to do we need to know about the host country economic system and on the basis of their economic system we will be framing our course of actions next is the economic parameters there are certain parameters on the basis of which you will be judging the quality of a country where you want to invest your money you might be looking up the income you might be looking at the distribution of the different resources over over there how helpful it would be for the kind of product you are going to take to the host country so you will be assessing the income and the distribution level of the host country you will be assessing the country on the basis of the demand may come 
from the customer. So if the demand is quite good, but there are certain issues related to the income, there are certain issues related to the distribution of the resources, then you will try to find out how I will be able to minimize these problems. Next expected cost of production and the net earning is very important thing which you have to analyze at one go that what if okay fine everything is in my favor there is a demand income distribution is also good distribution of the various factors of production of the resource availability is quite go good the demographic of a country is good Gov government is also supporting a lot of things are supporting you then you also have to evaluate what is going to be the cost of your production what will be your net earning because ultimately you are investing your money you are putting hefty amount in the host country and the amount which you are putting up in the country in the form of FDI maybe greenfield investment or maybe the greenfield development or maybe the brownfield investment whatever you are putting up of whatever the investment you are putting up so you need to wise enough in terms of calculating the cost of production you need to be wise enough in terms of net earning and which particular year is going to be your break even year the payback period you should analyze and assess well in advance before taking a decision of entering into any market it my payback period is going to be maybe after seven seven years, six years, eight years. So depending upon that, you can strategize your course of action. You can find out who will be funding me for those seven years because my break even point will come after seven years of investment. So you have to figure out your financial supports. You have to find out who from where you will be getting the supply, who will be your, uh, how you will be giving, how you will be managing your working capital in the country everything you have to assess well in advance instead of just looking at the host country you equally have to question yourself that okay fine this is good then what i can do right next is the inflation if in a country inflation is high automatically buying behavior of the customer or the purchasing power of the customer is going to go down so if a country is having high inflation will it be a right choice to enter into for sure the answer is no, because there will be low purchasing power. Fiscal policies and the monetary policy. Fiscal policy talk about the uh, how these are the government policies framed by the government of the country as far as India is concerned. And it revolve around two things, revenue generation and expenditure. So what is the ideology of government in terms of generating the revenue? They might be setting certain taxation policies, right? So how I will be able to get certain benefits if I'll be investing in special economic zone area, how it is going to facilitate me, right? If I'll be investing in some free trade zone area, right? How it will be facilitating me as well as the government. So you have to study the fiscal policy of the country, their revenue um, generation system and where they are putting up those money which they have generated in the form of the expenditure in the country, maybe in the infrastructural development they are putting up. Next is the monetary policy. Monetary policy is actually set by the central bank of the country, RPI in our case. Right. So monetary policies are actually regulating the flow of money in the market. How money flow is going to be regulated on the basis of the bank rate, open market securities, on the basis of repo rate, reverse repo rate, CRR, SLR. These are certain technical tools which RBI would be using to regulate the flow of money in the market. Say for example, if there are access of money floating in the market because of which inflation is rising. So what RBI would be doing? RBI is going to increase the bank rate. Bank rate is the rate at which commercial banks take the loan from RBI. So if commercial banks are paying more, what is going to happen? They are going to charge more from the customer. So as RBI, as RBI is charging more rate of interest from commercial bank, then, then these commercial banks are going to increase the rate of interest for home loan, car loan, personal loan. Eventually, there will be a demotivation in the market to buy a car 
from loan or to buy a home from loan or to buy certain and uh, to take the personal loan for having other assets for having other expenditures of meeting out the expenditures of the life there will be a discouragement another measure which rbi usually use in the monetary policies they increase crr percentage or they increase slr percentage crr is a cash reserve ratio which every bank has to deposit in their current account with rbi so if they are increasing the percentage of crr they will left with less amount of money to lend further secondly the slr slr is a statutory liquidity ratio which every commercial bank has to keep in the form of the gold or bonds so if government uh, rbi is increasing the slr and crr altogether what will happen they left with less amount of the money to be lend to the different customer so perspective of understanding these monetary policy and fiscal policy is going to help you to understand the kind of economic situation a country is going through in monetary policy will be a true indicator whether a country is having inflation or deflation or the country economy is stable now let's talk about some of the important economic factors like people government of your country might be taking certain economical decisions in order to protect the infant industries a moment before we talked about it that in order to protect the domestic companies or the infant industries there is going to increase the import duties right and if import duties are going to increase these infant industry can flourish and grow and if by that time the import duties are going to be increase uh, uh, lower down by the government for asking some for getting some foreign reserves they these infant industry might have grown by that time so for protecting the infant industries or for flourishing some small cottage industries of the country most of the time government takes certain corrective actions of increasing the import duty next for the promotion of industrialization what government has to do government has to liberalize the policy so that maximum foreign investment move towards your country retaliatory measures this is a negative here or you try to counter your maybe the other country that if they have increased the import duty of your product then you will retaliate and you will also increase the import duty without having your ground assessment so retaliate measures are not good like if in case india is increasing certain import duty for the chinese product in china in retaliating and they are also increasing some of the import duty on the product which they are taking from india the way america did india increase some of the import duty on the products in order to protect the domestic companies right they retaliate at the time when amazon the india was reforming e-commerce law right they creating certain tough measures for the amazon other online companies so america also retaliate by increasing the import duty of uh, um, the products which they are buying from india so retaliatory measures are not good these are negative and should not be taken into account and without having a ground study balance of payment adjustment if there are excess of import in a country and less of export for that you need to have a balance right you need to find out the balance because excess of import is going to have a defi- is going to have a deficit situation in the country and excess of export is also not good so both the situations are not good rather we have to move in the equilibrium situation and for that measure in order to have a balance of payment where the credit and the debit side balance out you need to make certain adjustments in such economic uh, economic decisions next for controlling the price if there are excessively increasing sometime government put the rebate the government subsidize certain products because they don't want excessive hike in the price of the commodity like uh, the us used to uh, control the price of the silicon so that the production of the silicon continues in the country without any price fluctuation so that it keep on providing the silicon to the computer uh, in uh, computer sector computer industries another is the employment generation so 
for generating the economy you need to for generation of the employment you need to have a sound economy in the country how because employment will not generate if there is no business and there will be no business there will be no investment if inflation is there so you need to control the price of certain commodities in order to facilitate the idea of investment in the market otherwise people if people have a fear that if i would be putting up the mar- money in the market my money might get stuck up my money might be lost so i will not take a risk of investing in the market so such kind of psychology has to be overcome and has to be uh, has to be nurt- has to be questioned or has to be answered well by the government by taking certain corrective actions so if i will not be putting up the money in the market i'll not investing any money in the market there will be no business and if there will be no business there will be no employment generation so for generating the in, in employment you need to control the economics of the country as well now let's look at some of the non economic factors significantly contributing the on the decisions of taking uh, i of taking a call of entering into any international market so first one is maintenance of essential industry you might be taking a call of establishing certain industry in your country which is at most essential for meeting out the basic requirements of the citizen of a country then you need to take some non economic factor decisions as a government trade with unfriendly country is not at all advisable right why because you there is a possibility of dishonoring your financial contract so if there is a possibility of dishonoring of your financial contract why to take a risk be take a non economic decision and stop or can discontinue your relation with the kind of a country who are not friendly with you preservation of national culture and identity or your you, your own significant position in the market this is what the france did france mm, ban any foreign com- the foreign country films because they don't want their culture to get diluted after seeing the movies of the foreign country this is what the france did preservation of community health this is what japan is into they are fi- taking all the measures to protect the health of the human animal and animals even animals they are in the japan they are having in- very good medical system they are having the good r&d system to identify how they can support the health even of the people even of the people living below the poverty line national security is another very important measure for which you should not be very uh, we should not always think of the earning money right here it's a matter of security so the matter of security comes first then earning money or having any business so these kind of the business can be kept enacted or these are the business where you can impose heavy licensing or heavy strict uh, strict uh, duties for the people who want to enter into such area because the national security cannot be compromised at all thus economic environment relate to all the factors that contribute to the country's attractiveness for the foreign business the economic environment can be very different from one nation to another it's not only about economic environment is about about all the factors of the environment are going to vary from country to country so what is important is important to have a fair understanding of each and every environmental factor you should scan the environment well in advance monitor the environment and then only take the action for entering into any country so dear students let's review what we did today today we talked about the political environment and in the political environment we notice that political environment cannot exist in isolation it go hand in hand with the legal environment and you as a investor have to give due importance to both political and the legal environment political environment largely governed by the kind of the party ruling the nation because the ruling party is having their own philosophy they are having their own ideology and the basis of their philosophy and ideology they will be forming the industrial policies 
So, if a particular government is favoring lot of privatization, they are going to be more, they are going to be certain actions which is related to supporting the private units as compared to public units. At the same time, the legal environment of a particular nation is not just about the regulatory frameworks, it is also something related to the custom duties, it is also, it is not just about the labor laws, it is not just about maybe the civil law, criminal law, it is about the custom duties also. It is about that how you will be taking a, a decision of importing certain raw material from a particular country like when you take a decision of investing in a country and you open your plant in a, for, in a foreign host country and you have to buy certain products or you have to import certain products from like you uh, opened your plant in India and you want to take certain products or raw material from China then it will be an import for you. So if what kind of the custom duties they are having had to be studied well in advance. Next economic environment of the nation is very important to be known well in advance because if the economy of a country is not rising well then your money will get stuck. So if you want your money to flourish and you want the return on investment you need to see that how economy of a particular country is moving to. What different policies government are forming in terms of fiscal policy or the monetary policy, what is the level of inflation in a country, what are the uh, different measures they are taking to protect the employment generations, they, what different measures they are taking to protect the infantry industries, infant industries of a particular country have to be studied in well in advance because these different measures will be giving you a fair idea about different set of opportunities and the threats. Having a fair understanding of opportunity set and the set of threats will give you a scope to figure out how you will be forming, how you will be making use of opportunities so that you can identify the list of your strength to be matched with the opportunities and you will also be able to figure out how your strength is going to help you to overcome the threats. And you must be having certain weaknesses also, right? So how I will be minimizing my weaknesses with the help of the available opportunities and the threats and the strength I am holding. So dear students, I hope you have understood the today's lecture. And uh, there are certain points which need to be covered in the international business environment like socio-cultural environment, technological environment and ecological environment. We will cover that uh, portion in the next lecture. For your reference, there is a list of the books. You can refer them for your detailed study. Thank you so much. All the best. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I am not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize uh, long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and, or college exams. But I am also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude immoral, vulgar and senseless. George Bernard Shaw absolutely loathed Shakespeare 
as he did Homer. But perhaps no other criticism about Shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that Shakespeare is a marvellous storyteller, provided someone has told him the story earlier. Now, this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true. None of Shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever. They are all written using pre-existing materials, pre-existing stories. Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets.